Today is October 12, uh, 2019, and we're at the Community Media Center here in Westminster, Maryland. I am, I am Charles Harrison, and I'm interviewing General Linda Singh uh, from Carroll County originally. Good morning, General Singh. Good morning. Good, good. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Uh, I understand that you've got a long and illustrious career uh, in service in the, to the U.S. government. Uh, what branch were you originally in? I originally started out Army National Guard, then switched over to the Army Reserves for a very short period, about six and a half years of my total time was in the Army Reserves, and then switched back to the Army National Guard, which is where I finished my overall career. Mm -hmm. Well, what made you draw or decide upon a career uh, in the military and service? All right. Well, for me, it wasn't uh, something that I had planned. Uh, I found myself uh, homeless and working to support myself. I had already dropped out of high school at the age of 16, and I just so happened to run across a uh, National Guard recruiter in the mall that was very persistent mm -hmm. and convinced me to consider the National Guard to take the test and and to see how all that you know all things would come out and you know what I didn't know and in, in hindsight now looking at it is that that opportunity that person coming into my life at that time probably saved my life right he took me off the streets um, it gave me another sense of purpose and started helping to set the foundations for my direction. And so I'm not going to say that my life did a, a complete, you know, 360 at that point in time, but it really put me on a much better trajectory. And, you know, things were still tough after that, but um, after I really started learning how to leverage my military skills mm -hmm. and to really continue to build on that experience, I found myself um, finding better and better job opportunities as a result of that. Mm -hmm. How did, was it difficult for you to, to, to uh, be elevated or go up to the command structure, or did you just want to remain as a, as a service or enlistee type? Well, so I stayed enlisted for 11 years, mm -hmm. and I found that um, through the enlisted ranks, it seemed like at the time it was just extremely difficult. And every time you turned around, they were doing new requirements, new this, and so that's really just the military life. But um, I think what happened for me is that a good non-commissioned officer, uh, it was actually my first sergeant, had told me that he felt that my skills and my background, as well as my demeanor, um, he felt that I would make a very good officer. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into that and he sent me to talk to another officer and they really kind of coached, kind of coached me and said, you know, we really think you need to consider this and do this. And so they started helping me to look at the parameters. Mm -hmm. And so then I left the reserves and I came back to the National Guard and decided to go to officer candidate school. And once I was accepted into officer candidate school, my trajectory, it seemed like things went really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get every position that I wanted, but when I started getting promoted, I made every promotion at what we call minimum time and grade, mm -hmm. um, which really put me on a very, very fast, fast track. And so um, and it wasn't because they were just promoting me to be promoting me. I mean, I worked hard. Uh, I was uh, very talented. I knew my job. And I think what made a huge difference is that I could show different benefits based on my civilian career. I started really um, helping to balance out what I was getting in the military and vice versa. Okay. Well, at that time, the uh, officer ranks in cadre uh, did not have that many minorities, right. uh, particularly a double minority, you're yes. being a, a female also. Yes. Uh, how did you cope with that situation and did you find it prohibitive? Well, I mean, I think there were times when uh, I was called upon because I was a minority, because they needed the representation. Mm -hmm. And then there were times where you get excluded, right? You're not necessarily part of the conversations, you're not necessarily part of what I would call the boys club. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you have to really, and, and I think for me, it was, there were times when I could really feel it and it would be really frustrating, but I think the persistence that I had and continuing to find my own way and do it my way, I think is what made me more successful and made me more, um, I think, accepted by a lot of my counterparts. And so when I became a, an officer, I became an uh, ordinance officer. Mm -hmm. And so I worked in maintenance. And it was nothing for you to see me out there with my folks, you know, you know out in the motor pool. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had grown up around working on vehicles and things like that. So it was not abnormal to me. And I actually loved um, kind of the ordinance branch. And so that helped me to really relate more to the, the males. Mm -hmm. And I think that they seen that and they were just like, you know, she's willing to do everything that we're willing to do. Okay. Well, what's, what were some of the assignments and the post that you actually served in? Yeah. So I, when I started out, I was originally in personnel as, as enlisted. And so I worked in personnel. I also supported uh, training and operations. And then when I became an officer, I started out as a platoon leader, mm -hmm. uh, a shop officer, uh, then went into company command of the maintenance company, and so I kind of moved up through the, the maintenance company, and then went to uh, what we call the support staff and started learning operations and things at a much broader level, and it just continued to, to go from there. So I've commanded at every level uh, within the, um, the National Guard and um, to really culminate at a an assignment that is really what I would call a, a premier assignment, which is the adjutant general um, mm -hmm. for the, the state of Maryland. That's wonderful. Uh, listen, can you um, give us a, or share with us uh, a unique experience uh, throughout your long and lengthy career? <laughs> well, there was, there was a lot of unique experiences, but you know, the one that, that sticks in my mind um, and, you know, this is, you know, sometimes it's the small things. I mean, obviously there's a lot of really big experiences, but I remember being in Afghanistan and I was going to visit one of the uh, military police facilities and to look at their training center. And when I was walking in um, the kitchen staff, there was a, a female Afghan working in the kitchen staff. And they were so all enamored with me. I mean, they knew that I was, you know, higher, higher rank and I was a colonel at that time. And to them, colonels, you know, mm -hmm. that was a big deal. And they came out of the kitchen to engage with me. They couldn't even speak English, but they were engaging with me. And the lady, she was just like, you know, uh, tea, you know, did I want tea? And um, I just think, you know, I remember how they were looking at me and they were just so enamored with the fact that I was a female, a senior ranking female here engaging with the males. And it, it sticks out to me even still to this day because I remember her expression. I remember how kind and outreaching she was. And that was a, you know, that was a different experience. And, and it's those types of things that sometimes stick in your mind even more than the big events. Was it over your career, was it difficult to, to engage with individuals of different cultures and and relate that to your experiences um, uh, in the military? You know, when I first started out, um, I was not as culturally diverse because I grew up in the country. So obviously I grew up in the Carroll County, Frederick County area. So uh, I was not very culturally sensitive. Um, when I met my husband, my current husband, mm -hmm. um, he is from Trinidad and Tobago and started integrating with his family. And I think that really helped to start expanding my cultural awareness. And then when I got a consulting job for a global consulting company, mm -hmm. I got a chance to work with people from all over the world because they had offices in 350 different countries. And so um, just having that level of engagement and then when I started engaging more from the military side internationally, it was just a normal, it was a normal thing for me. I found that I was very intrigued by people mm -hmm. and I'm very intrigued by culture. And so it, you know, I will walk up to someone and have a conversation with them. And if I hear an accent mm -hmm. and I'll just say, you know, where are you from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'm, I'm curious. I mean, it intrigues me. And so 
um, I just allow that to kind of guide me and, and to come out to people, and I think they feel that. Mm -hmm. All of your career, you've served as a role model to minorities uh, and to women, uh, and you've set the example for males in dealing and progressing through the military service. What advice would you give a young, expiring individual coming out of Carroll County yes. uh, and, and trying to see the world? Well, I'd say first off, you have to be able to take every opportunity that's given to you and see that for what it can add to your toolkit. Um, and sometimes you may not even understand that the opportunity can be growth. Mm -hmm. And if you get the, uh, the chance to be able to take a role that allows you to travel to other countries, mm -hmm. do that as soon as possible because that's going to make you more globally um, rich in terms of your experiences. And then when you come back to be able to work your job, it will give you a, a different perspective. And that's probably the, the biggest thing that I wish I would have done sooner in my career is gotten the opportunity to actually go abroad mm -hmm. um, because it's helped me to see the world so differently mm -hmm. and to appreciate what we have here in the United States. Um, so that would be the thing that I would um, definitely uh, recommend for them. The other thing is that they have to be lifelong learners. You can't just come out of school and not continue to progress. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you have to be someone that goes and gets uh, a degree. Uh, a lifelong learner means that you're trying to soak in every opportunity, you're trying to do that self-learning, mm -hmm. uh, and that can come in many different forms, but you need to continue to do that. And um, that is, is probably the, if those are the two things that I could say to someone, it would be those two things. Okay, thank you. Well, listen, um, sometimes it's difficult for military people to make that transition from military life yeah. uh, into civilian life yes. and to capitalize on the experiences gained yeah. while in the military. Yes. How have you been able to do that successfully thus far? Well, well so I think it was easier for me because I was running a dual career because being National Guard and Reserves, I had a civilian career going almost the whole time with the exception of the last five years. And so going back into the civilian sector and really um, you know, making that transition is normal for me because I've lived it for so long and, and I've had to be well versed in, in both sides, meaning you know, I have to be able to really speak English to someone and not get into the military lingo. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's different for me this time is the transition that I'm making is into being a new small business owner. And that is completely different. And um, you, you really need to look at and be intentional about the relationships that you've already built and how are you going to leverage those relationships to maybe make additional business connections, additional connections that's going to allow you to be able to grow your business. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, is different. And I think, you know, even for me, um, all the people that I've met over my career, and I have more contacts than I can even probably catalog, um, I was not thinking of those interactions and engagements as in, okay, you know, I need to be really taking stock of who I'm meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how can we be of service to one another when I'm in a different role? And so I'm having to kind of go back through and, and sift through some of those relationships and to say, you know, I've, I've got relationships all over the place, but, um, you know, did I, uh, was I intentional enough in those engagements? Because, you know, now going forward, I have to be very, very intentional. Mm -hmm. Clearly, your leadership skills are, are apparent. Uh, the minute you, I, I, I speak to you, uh, and it is self-evident. What would you recommend to young Carroll Countyans uh, to develop those skills in leadership? The first thing is you, you got to get to know yourself, right? You have to look into the mirror and say, who am I truly? And if you don't know, spend some time finding that out. Um, because I'm very comfortable with who I am. Mm -hmm. I know what I do well. I know what I don't do well. I know how to engage with people, and you have to be able to test your boundaries there. 
-hmm. You know, leaders come in all forms and fashion. And so you can't just look at a, a general saying and say, well, I can't be a leader because she's, you know, of this level and caliber. But you have to remember, I've got 38 years plus mm -hmm. of time being a leader and, and working in so many different scenarios. Um, then you need to get the experience. So every leader that starts out is not experienced. So if you would have seen the, the Linda Singh of the past mm -hmm. and the Linda Singh of today, completely different. Um, yes, there were skills and traits that I kept along the way and I continued to hone those skills, but my experiences have made me a much more rich leader in terms of being able um, to see things. The other thing I would tell them is not just seeing yourself, but see other people. So if you have a job and, and you're managing people, don't just look at them as employees. Don't just look at them as in, oh, they have a job to do. They are people just like you are. So you need to get to know your folks and treat them. And, and it doesn't mean that you, know, you uh, can't have the hard conversations, but if you treat people with a level of respect, even when you need to have those tough conversations, it usually goes much easier than you can imagine. And if you can leave someone whole at the end of the day, you have to deliver the tough messages, mm -hmm. and then you have to be able to say to them, you need to pick yourself back up. To me, those are things that leaders need to develop, and they need to get really good at. Um, the last piece that I would say is hone in and develop your ethical decision-making skills and your critical decision-making skills because that's what a leader needs to be able to do. That's what we need to be able to do in everyday life. And I think when you see bad things happen, uh, where you know these leaders, they have these missteps, a lot of times it's because they've made some level of um, misjudgment in their ethics, mm -hmm. right? They, they have really skipped over maybe the value system or maybe their value system is, is not the way it should be. Uh, you need to spend some time developing that, and, and you can't do that if you don't start with yourself. Aside from your business, uh, your, your, your uh, civilian business that you're yes. partaking now, what's in the future for General Singh? Well, so um, here soon, hopefully, I'm going to affiliate with a university uh, to be a, uh, a leader in residence, and so I'm uh, I'm, you know, working uh, right now with the school to be able to look at that and, and hopefully we'll sign up with the school. I'm going to continue to, to work my business. And um, there is a, 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 uh, a group that I'm associated with that focuses in on African-American leaders and managers in the corporate sector. And so I am going to engage and get uh, a lot more involved in that particular area because we're still seeing that our African-American population, when you really truly look at the numbers, mm -hmm. are still not doing as well as, as they should be. And our African-American males are definitely not doing as, as well in that corporate environment. And so uh, being able to engage with those organizations, and there are two, as a matter of fact, I just spent the last couple of days with those, those organizations. And so I'm gonna be spending a lot more time focusing in on that. And then, um, you know, I do have, uh, you know, one overall project that I'm going to be working on. That's a technology project mm -hmm. that I'm going to be looking to raise the funds for us to do the research and to develop an, an application that is really focused in on hopefully transforming the way that we look at the leader experience. Okay. Um, and so that's what General Singh is going to do. Well, General Singh, we certainly appreciate and thank you for your Absolutely. service. Uh, and above and beyond that, we thank you for the wisdom and the guidance in your words that you have today imparted Absolutely. to the youth and to the citizens of Carroll County. Absolutely. General Singh, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you.